what we are doing now in the online course world is we have the Discord channel and uh, we have four weeks of meetings. We've had the first week of already. The next week is going to be early July, I think, or mid-July after the Euros. So what we do is we discuss certain topics and then we go away and have two months of homework where we really learn to understand those topics uh, by practicing and providing our own feedback, combining our feedback, having meetings and discussing what we've found. So it's not just reading a book, watching a video, it's interactive. Us as a group, we work together, get through everything, I answer questions, we discuss topics, then we actually do it in the real world. And uh, that way I think that we can all learn to adjust our cars better, understand our cars better, and have better results on the track, and more fun at the track, because our cars are working how we want them to work. I will, from time to time, share videos on YouTube so you get an idea of what's happening. And then if you really want to be a part of it, then you can join invisiblespeed.net. Always open and available. Okay, so um, the basics of car setup first. I guess first we could uh, remind ourselves a bit about what we uh, discussed yesterday, about how the car is blind. And the car is a blind Al Pacino. Are you blind? Doesn't know where it's going next. So you have to introduce every new idea to the car. You need to let it know that you want to accelerate or you want to turn or you want to brake. Everything you do, you need to do in a way that you imagine that you don't want to surprise the car. You want to do it smoothly, controllably. You don't want to break traction. You don't want anything surprising to happen. You want to maintain the sort of general nature of the car and the traction it has. So smooth inputs on the transmitter. That's key. That's step number one. And uh, that will become clearer to you after I explain these next few points. So the number one thing we have to talk about is tires. Because the tires are what connects the car to the track. The tires determine the maximum uh, possible performance of a car because they determine how much traction or grip is available. You can have the, the same set of tires on two different cars and they can perform differently due to the setup or, of uh, the car. But the maximum possible performance is always determined by the tires. And there are a few things you need to understand about tires to be able to understand how uh, the cars work. This is in the wrong place. It's like behind me. The first is that... Another thing that's important to know is that tires can only offer uh, or tires can only perform to their maximum potential in one direction at a time. So you, you can accelerate in a straight line and get the most out of the tire or you can brake and get the most performance out of the tire or you can turn. But you can't accelerate and turn at the same time and achieve the best performance in acceleration. As soon as you start turning, the available uh, grip to accelerate decreases. So I can show you that the maximum amount of grip that a tire can offer can only be achieved in one direction. So if you break this, this black circle here, or this point here is represented the maximum amount of traction. If you go outside of this, you've, you're asking too much of the tire. It starts to slide. So if you brake in a straight line, you have this much potential uh, performance available to you. If you're turning left, you have that much. If you're accelerating, that much. So this black circle here, is, this is the maximum performance. But as you can see, 
if you are braking and then you want to turn, you would go in this direction here. Uh, because as soon as you start turning, well, you go outside of the, th the circle, you're asking too much. So you have to reduce your braking as you start turning to remain inside the circle. Does this make sense to you? So yes. far, uh, the red line represents how an average driver who is in full control of the car at all times drives. So they brake. Then they let go of the brake and then they start turning. Then they turn. Uh, this is actually a, an above average driver because they are actually braking to the maximum performance limit of the tires and turning to the maximum performance limit. So it's actually a good driver already to be able to do that. The closer to the car here, the, the closer to the center of the circle you are, the less uh, performance you are getting out of the tire. So the red line represents a good driver already, but they aren't maximizing the potential of the grip available. So they brake, then they let go of the brake, then they turn, and as they turn, they actually achieve the best performance of the tires while steadily cornering at the same speed. They stop turning, the car is straight, then they accelerate. And again, they accelerate to the maximum performance of the tires. That's all well and good, and a driver that that's capable of doing this will already be very fast. But they aren't going to be able to do a lap as fast as possible, not as fast as the best drivers in the world. Because what they are able to do is they can brake into a corner, and as they ease off the brake, they turn into the corner. So they are following this yellow line here. Then through the middle of the corner, they aren't braking or accelerating. They are just maximizing the cornering potential of the car and the tires. And then as they start straightening, straightening out, they are already on the throttle and accelerating. And then as the car is uh, straight, they are accelerating at you know, full, uh, full power. So they, they when they, as they navigate a lap around the track, they are following more of this uh, yellow line compared to the red one. So the difference between a sort of average driver and a great driver is how close to the limit of the tire's performance they can be at all times driving around the track. That's what separates the truly talented and skilled drivers that they can be close to the limits of traction as they as they do a lap around the track where a lesser driver will at some points be close to the limit but then then they will be sort of coasting unnecessarily they could be pushing the car more but they don't because they uh, want to stay in control so that's this red line so what most uh, races do though like we discussed yesterday is they go way outside of this they ask too much of the tires and they are drifting and sliding around and spinning out or pushing out of corners. So this sort of gets forgotten. We are accelerating as hard as we can and, and turning and, and uh, we break too late trying to turn into corners and the car pushes past the apex. So m most of us, we have the problem that we go outside of this circle uh, and we need to calm down, slow down, and try to be this uh, red line first. That's what we need to do. We need to start focusing on how we brake, how we turn, how we accelerate, and uh, try and do it smoothly so the car is in control at all times, and we stay on the line we want to do. And then as we improve, we can move closer to this uh, yellow line. The last thing I have to say about tires is that I mentioned that as you load a tire more, as you push it harder into the ground, you get more grip. Well, we have four of these on a car and we have four wheel drive cars also. So that the car will actually have the most grip when all four tires are loaded 
to a certain amount. That depends on the compound, the tire, whatever the sort of best load you could put on that particular tire. If all four tires had that load, the car would have the most traction. Yes. Okay, so this, this line here, this curve represents the traction of a tire, the grip of a tire. And here on the x-axis we see load. So as load increases, the available traction a tire has to offer also increases. But as I said, it's not linear. At first it increases uh, uh, a lot more than later on. Later on, as you add load, the grip doesn't increase that much anymore. This is just how rubber tires work. So if we imagine that a car is driving around a corner, we understand that the outer wheel, C, will be loaded more, more than the inner wheel, which is B. And when we average out the, the amount of grip that this axle of the car could offer, it's this dot here, BC. So this is the amount of grip available for, from that axle. Let's say it's the rear, rear of the car, for example. So this is the inner rear tire, outer rear tire. The average of the rear end of the car is here. So if we had this theoretical case where uh, both inner and outside tires were equally loaded to the same amount as the total load on the rear axle in this example, they would be here. So this difference is the traction we lose because uh, the inside and outside tires are unequally loaded. Does this make sense to you? Looking at this graph, because this is really key to everything. Because, for example, when we talk about anti-roll bars, what an anti-roll bar does is it transfers more load onto the outer tire and lifts up the inner tire. So the difference between the load on the inside and outside tire will be greater. So the inner tire will be less loaded, the outer tire will be more heavily loaded. So then if you check where the average uh, load is then, it will be down here. So even less traction available. So when you put an anti-roll bar on, you are increasing the load transfer, the load difference between inside and outside, and that causes you to have less traction at that end of the car. Basically, we understand that when we drive around the corner, this, this case, AA, the maximum performance, the maximum cornering force with left and right tires equally loaded is impossible. It's impossible because of physics. We know that we will always have load transfer to the outside. Uh, what we are trying to do is we want to get as close to this as possible, right? For as long time as we can while we're driving around the track. And because we have load transfer, what we also want to do is we want to uh, take advantage of it because it can also be a good thing. Yes. Yeah, so there's a car accelerating here. Uh, the rear is squatting, the nose is up in the air. So we think, ah, load transfer. So it's a visual cue that load is transferring to the rear. Well, while that is true, the amount that a car squats or dives or rolls, that doesn't actually tell us how much load is transferring. Load, is, load transfer is not something that happens because of suspension. It actually, in fact, uh, a car that is squatting very much or rolling very much, probably for most of the time is transferring less load than a car that would be just flat and you can't see it move at all. So we often think that, oh, if a car is squatting a lot, then it's transferring a lot of load, but it's not that way. So even though this is a visual cue that, okay, load is now transferring to the rear, the suspension is not what's causing the load transfer. Even with no suspension, like a go-kart, load is still transferring between the different tires. So just something to remember. Uh, sometimes we can use the visual cue to see that 
if the rear tires are completely in the air well yeah there's no it, all the weight is on the front and yeah as we already discussed when you corner cars roll to the outside and also load is transferring we can clearly see that inside front tire is almost off the ground here I mentioned that we can take advantage of load transfer so it's something we don't want but it just exists and one way we can take advantage of it is that we understand that when tires are loaded more there's more grip so if we have a car that pushes and we need more steering if we brake before a corner and time it such that the load transfers to the front and then turn the front tires will have more grip and the rear tires will have less so the car turns more because there's more load on the front tires or when we accelerate we actually want the rear to grip more uh, so that the car accelerates straight well it's good good thing to have load transfer at that point because we can have load transfer onto the rear tires and that means that they grip more so uh, even though I started out saying that we don't want load transfer it's also a good thing and we can also use it uh, to our benefit so these pictures I showed you now of cars uh, squatting or rolling or diving onto the front I said that it's not a direct indication of how much load is transferring but that's actually what we adjust on the car to control the load transfer and this is really the key point to everything because the pitch and roll of the car affects the time it takes for load to transfer and time is the key word here we understand that load transfers no matter what as you're driving around the car uh, track and the suspension moves squats rolls dives the time it takes for the suspension to move is the time that load transfer is being delayed right so the longer you delay load transfer the longer tires are more equally loaded and the longer the car maintains a stable amount of traction uh, so this is one reason why a softer car is more forgiving and less responsive the speed that the load transfer happens is what determines if a car has more initial grip or overall grip that's a concept that we need to introduce now also so initial grip means that the car is very responsive as you begin to turn the car has a lot of grip and turns very quickly into corners for example uh, that's the reason for that is that load transfers very quickly and when that happens there's a peak of traction and then after that the traction is reduced because load transfer now tires are more unequally loaded and then uh, for example the front axle would have less uh, traction so going into the corner load transfers quickly which gives you a peak of traction the car turns in then inside front tire lightly loaded outside front tire heavily loaded the front end won't have as much grip anymore so the car turns in aggressively and then pushes or if uh, if your rear end doesn't have enough grip what could happen is your car turns in aggressively the rear brakes loose and slides so you have oversteer in the car so a car that's very aggressive and responsive you can say that it has a lot of initial grip and that has to do with the fact that l the load is transferring very quickly uh, between different tires so then you could say okay if we just want a car to be very comfortable and stable and easy to drive then why don't we just make it roll a lot and dive a lot on the front and 
squat and it will be very comfortable and smooth to drive on the track. Well, here's where the working range comes in. I like to call it the working range because here you see this car going into the corner and everything looks okay. So you can see that it's diving a bit on the front, it's rolling, the rear is a bit up in the air, but all the tires are still on the ground, gripping the track nicely, right? Everything looks under control. So here we see another car in the same corner and this car has dived heavily onto the front, the inside rear tire is off the ground. So you can see also that it's rolled a lot more than the previous example. So this would be an example of a car that's softer, right? So we can say, okay, it should be easier to drive now. It's softer. Well, here's where the problem comes in. You drive through a section just like before, but now you are pushing the car beyond uh, the limits of its performance. It's going outside the working range. What I mean that with the working range is the amount of roll or dive of the front or squatting of the rear that uh, is possible before you start having negative consequences of a wheel up in the air or excessive positive camber on the rear tire tires. So you can't make a car just as soft as possible and think that, okay, now I'll have a lot of overall grip. The car will be very stable and easy because it won't look like this anymore in corners. It won't be within the working range, uh, tire camber, tires on the ground, everything sort of looking right. It will start going wrong, like in this example. Uh, David, you had a question. Yeah, what you would, what you would suck, uh, change on the Agama? When you see this picture, what would you change? Okay, so... The, uh, but the answer is not the car, so... <laughs> yeah, so basically, without going into too much detail, the problem here is that the car is too soft for the requirements. The grip level is maybe... Uh, too high for how the car is set up. So things that could help in this situation would be, for example, a harder front spring, harder front anti-roll bar. Uh, that, those would be the first sort of obvious things. Also, when this happens, it could be that the rear uh, anti-roll bar is too hard or the rear end is too stiff and doesn't allow the car to roll. I don't want to talk about roll centers yet. Uh, here's just another example of uh, a car that's being pushed outside of its working range. So the rear end is squatting very heavily on the outside tire. The outside tire is in positive camber. The front, both tires are almost off the ground. The front inside is off, off the ground. This is not in the working range anymore. Uh, Ron Nefalco is in this picture. He's losing time here. The car isn't performing as well as it should be. He could be faster if the setup was better. The car has gone outside of its working range. We introduced all the concepts. Now we need to figure out the conclusion to this, right? And then we need some questions, hopefully. Because this is, uh, this, as I said, this, is, this really is key to everything. If, if we can get these ideas now understood, then we can learn a lot during this year together. What I am saying is basically that we want to adjust the car so that we can control it comfortably for the entire lap. And if we push the car a bit too far, it won't do anything surprising. Uh, we want that the car allows us as a, a driver to have time to react to any changes that occur. If we are losing traction, we want to be able to have time to respond and counter steer or adjust our driving, 
right? We do that by reducing initial grip, increasing overall grip. So we make the car softer so that it pitches and rolls more, which delays load transfer, which gives it a more calm and stable nature. As our skills improve, we can make a car faster. Typically, we will make it harder, stiffer, so it responds more quickly, so we can drive a faster lap time around the track. Because we are now, we have more skills. We, our responses or reflexes are faster, our inputs are more precise, and when we are really good, what happens is that we aren't reacting to the car anymore, we are controlling it. So we are actively driving the car, and because it's very responsive, and because our inputs are very precise, we are determining exactly what's happening. So we want it to slide a bit, we make it slide a bit. We want it to stop sliding, we stop it sliding. Uh, we are actively driving the car, not reacting to what the car is doing. That's a big distinction, actually. Many people, they are driving, mostly they are reacting to what the car is doing. They are following the track, but the car is doing all kinds of small things that they react to. Whereas the top guys, they are in full control. They aren't, sometimes, of course, they have to react to some surprise, but mostly, if you watch Ongaro drive, for example, when he's in the groove, he's placing the car and doing everything. He isn't reacting to it. The car is responding to his inputs and he is in full control. So car setup is directly linked to your skill level as a driver. And that's why when people just copy the setup sheets of the best drivers, it doesn't make any sense to me because it's not going to be the best setup for you because you don't have that skill set. Um, a top driver will want to have a car that has more initial grip, so it has a bigger sort of maximum amount of traction, and they control it so that they don't go past that. Or if they go past that, they go past that intentionally. So they go into a hairpin and they slide the corner, uh, like slide the rear end out, but then they catch it at the exact right time and then continue. So they are breaking traction intentionally, dr overdriving the car in certain ways intentionally, and then getting it back in control, right? So they have a responsive car with a high amount of maximum traction. And when they want to, they go over that to be able to do some kind of maneuver with the car, right? But for most of us, that's going to be very hard to control. We don't want that. So we choose a car that's a bit less responsive, a bit lower maximum amount, amount of grip. But if we push it too far, not much changes. Like maybe it just pushes a bit or slides with all four tires. You know, it doesn't surprise you. It's a very sort of gradual change. You'll notice that, oh, this, this lap I was a bit slower because I messed up that corner a bit. But you didn't spin out. Do you see what I mean? So there's different ways to set a car up. And the best way that I have uh, figured to explain it is this initial versus uh, overall grip. Car setup is a sort of balance of matching your skill level and preference as a driver to the performance of the car. That's how every single one of us will achieve our best results. When we match the car setup to our own skill level. And the last couple of weeks I've been driving touring car. I haven't driven in over 10 years. And modified touring car is really fast, very precise. And you can really notice setup changes with touring car. And also you can really notice how the balance of the car changes. And a car that has a lot of steering but is harder to drive or it's very stable, has just the right amount of steering. So 
it's been uh, it's been really good uh, for me to do that and also just go through these basic setup things that we're going to talk about now in the next few days because they basically they do the same thing in touring cars just that we don't have jumps so what i've done there is i have uh, got used to the car and been able to do consistent five minute runs and then just made small adjustments to make the car have more steering and have more initial grip and I start making more mistakes but my best lap improves and then I get used to that and then I can go consistently faster then I can make another small adjustment to make the car again have more steering and so on and so forth so it it really is a thing if if we could understand to stop copying setups and start thinking about what we actually need ourselves we could all improve a lot guarantee it and as our skills improve we make the car naturally faster yeah now i hope you have uh, good questions so we really get through this subject thoroughly before we start talking about uh, all these different setup changes because when we talk about the setup changes i'll refer back to these things right back to the traction circle, back to the axles with the inside and outside tire, equally or more unequally loaded, working range, initial versus overall grip, all these things. So please, if you have any questions, ask away. I'll start. Um, okay. With there being so many different changes that can do the same or similar things, where would you want to start? um like the least aggressive to say the most aggressive change for a car yes uh jq i was racing on S sunday uh it was yeah. a medium high grip track it was a little bit edgy uh it was dry and uh in in the 90 degree corners fast corners the car would like uh, oversteer in the middle of the corner uh what what change sh should i have done to to fix this um, I went to a, a new track uh, to me last season and uh, somebody at the track was taking pictures and they posted them online and I saw a picture of my my car and I was, I guess, coming off uh, the straight and, and going into the first turn and obviously I was under braking and the the front end looked like it was really dived down. Those pictures that you showed kind of reminded me of that. And, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is, okay, the front springs are too soft but maybe that's not necessarily the case. Uh, about uh, driving, so what kind, so nothing about the setup, but uh, driving uh, input for in, from the uh, transmitter. Yeah. Uh, some some example, uh, 90 degrees uh, tur turn or some uh, very long turn, how to drive that. How, how, uh, what kind of input you put in the transmitter? I have a question related to hairpins. I'm always struggling, struggling with them. And, and um, in setup wise, uh, uh, in the hairpins, uh, when you are off power, uh, do you set the car so that it uh, breaks loose when you... Uh, Returning off power? Yes. So it, you mentioned camber in the video you're showing. What would be a benefit to more or less camber? This is what we've been talking about now today. So that fast or easy, initial grip or overall grip. And when we talk about the, all these different setup things, we will think about this aspect also for them. So we don't start talking about all the different settings, but I'm just sort of showing you and reminding you that this is the idea so basically here i've explained it so when you think about the issues you have with your car setup a problem on the track for example spinning out uh, mid corner something like that if you feel that the problem occurs after a peak of traction so you have very good grip 
and then something happens and you lose all your traction suddenly. That means that you probably have too much initial grip. So your car is set up too fast for you. Maybe a very skilled driver would prefer that because they won't push the car to that point where it loses all the grip suddenly unless they want to do that intentionally. But if it's happening to you, it's a signal to you that your car is too fast for your skill level, right? A humbling experience. You're spinning out in corners. What's going on, right? So you would want to make changes to make your car more easy. You make it so it has more overall grip, less initial grip. So the opposite is true. So if, if you have a problem where your car is, isn't responding enough and uh, maybe when you accelerate, it's fishtailing side to side. It doesn't want to really grip. It feels easy to drive, but maybe your lap times are slow. Maybe your friend is beating you who you should be beating, but your car feels easy and smooth to drive. That means that you have too much overall grip, not enough initial grip. So you need to make changes to make your car more fast and aggressive. So this, I think, is a very helpful way to think about setups. So when is your problem occurring? Is it after a peak of high traction or is it just generally uh, the same traction the whole time and you have some problem? because of that. And then, yeah, here we list all the setup options and which direction the adjustment is more fast, or which direction it's easy, which direction it's more initial grip, uh, less initial grip, more overall grip. And the reason I picked, what was it? Ride height, droop, camber, front toe, shock oils, I think, for temperature. Those were the, the first things that I said that we would talk about. The reason is that they are very powerful and often overlooked. And I want to make sure that anyone who has taken part of this course will never overlook those again, because they are, they are really key. I could, if I saw you at the track, I can guarantee that I can improve your car. It's a money back guarantee, basically. You can be at your home track for uh, the entire summer. And you can tell me that your car is awesome. And I will guarantee that I can improve your car. We spend just an hour, an hour or two at the track. I'll make a few small changes and you will go faster and you will feel more comfortable. And the only thing I will change is ride height, droop, camber. Probably only camber. That's not kidding. Money back guarantee. Serious. I'm serious. Because I know none of you truly find the optimal camber. None of you. Zero. You don't do it. The, uh, we're going to start talking about camber soon. I think we have to talk about camber tomorrow. I'm getting all excited. Different tires require different camber settings. Different track temperature requires a different cam camber setting. You know, it's insane. Because of how tires can affect the uh, initial grip or overall grip. Can be a tire the problem? Yes, it can. Um, the tire design or the tire compound? I think more design. Okay. I would say more design, yes, than, than compound. Compound can offer more or less grip, but the feel is similar. But the tire design, uh, affects it a lot. But later on, we'll talk about tires also at some point, like tire choice. But yes, it can have a big effect on that. Some tire designs have uh, more initial grip. And uh, if you look at some drivers like uh, Ongaro, he often runs tires like that, like Catapult, aka Catapult, for example. Most drivers, if they try them, they'll be like, these are shit. They're so loose. How does he drive this, right? No, no one used them. Right. But the reason he drives them is because they have a lot of initial grip, right? So the maximum amount of traction he can get is high. He drives in a way where he goes close to that maximum amount, doesn't go over it. Most 
drivers, they go to that maximum point and past it and say these tires are shit, they're loose. You see what I mean? So then they would pick another tire which has less maximum grip, but it's much broader. It's not so precise. You can push it a bit too far. You don't notice really. Then you notice, ah, I'm losing a bit of grip and then you adjust, you know? So yeah. that's, that's the thing. Like some tires, are, another tire from AKA is double down. That's also initial grip, not overall grip. Then if you go to the other side, tires that have a lot of overall grip, like I-beam or cross brace, very yeah. flexible sidewalls, big pins. Yeah, tires do affect it a lot. Okay. Okay. Stop the recording.